Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Our time is slipping away, and I'd like to call your attention to Isaiah the 6th chapter. It's always a privilege to speak to this student body because I consider you to be the greatest people in all of the world. People that have come from various parts of the United States and even from the world with a calling upon their life, looking for direction in God's Word and in God's Spirit. And so I've said it before and I say it again. I feel a special privilege because I feel like that I'm speaking to people that are really the elite of our Pentecostal youth of this day and of the youth of the world. Isaiah chapter 6 is a very interesting chapter to me, and I would like for the next few moments to share some thoughts with you. I'd like to read the first nine verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the ain't or one of the seraphims, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. God bless you. You may be seated. Verse 5 talks about a man that was really in the presence of God. And that's really my subject today. I'd like to entitle it, Revival on the Eve of God's Rapture. Verse 5 says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. You talk about a man being in the middle of a situation that he wasn't prepared for. Oh, the contrast of the first four verses in reference to the fifth verse. In the first four verses, we see that heaven was being exposed, and there was a mere man that was in the midst of all of this, that was seeing and beholding what was going on, and he found himself in the midst of God, and he did not feel qualified. He said, I, woe is me, for I am undone. And then in verse 7 it says that there was an angel that came and took a coal from off of the altar, and touched his lips with it, his iniquity was taken away, his sins were purged, and he said, I heard the voice of the Lord at that time saying, who will I send? Who will go for us? And he said, here am I. Now I want you to notice in that part that there's a man here that in the prior verses we have seen is so unqualified, and now... After the coals have touched him, he's ready to go. 
And I think it's very significant to note that what changed him was the coals that touched his lips. Uh, and more significant than that was where the coals came from. And it came from off the altar. Never before in history has there been such a time as this for the church today. I believe that the signs of the times that we are living in today mark an unprecedented era in history for the church because I believe that the rapture of the church is not very far away. And I want to preach tonight or today on three aspects of revival that will prepare you for the rapture of the church and my lord more than ever before we need to we need to assure our hearts that we're ready to meet him at his coming i want you to notice again the text the bible says that isaiah made a statement woe is me in the first five chapters of this same book we see that same word used a whole lot. Woe, woe, woe. It's a word of grief. It's a word of depression. Isaiah defined what he meant by woe in the next statement. He said, for I am undone. I am full of grief. I am depressed. I don't feel like I've got it all together. The reason he felt that way was because he was standing in the midst of the presence of God. The Bible says that there were seraphims that were there. Each one had six wings. They twain covered his face. They covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And they were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filling the glory of the Lord. And the post of the door at the temple began to move. And the house was filled with smoke. Oh, friend, that was enough to make any man that was in that predicament and that situation to feel very unqualified with what was taking place. And Isaiah felt that way. He said, woe is me. But prior to that in the first five chapters, Isaiah was pronouncing woes upon everything else. There was sin. There was transgression. There was iniquity. There was apostasy like you had never seen before in Israel. And Isaiah was going around and Isaiah was pronouncing woes upon everything. But when Isaiah came to the experience of this chapter, he begins to move into a different realm because God is dealing with him instead of all of them. And no more rest upon him about the burdens of the others uh, and he begins to see himself and he begins to cry woe is me the first act uh, aspect of revival that will prepare you for the rapture of the church is an upward revival I want you to notice he said woe is me from the bottom of humanity Isaiah began to look up the woe is a state of grief or depression. It is a state of confession. I am in the surroundings of the holiness of God. I am a man of unclean lips, Lord. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. Mine eyes have seen the King today, the Lord of hosts. And I don't feel right about being here have you ever felt uh, just a little bit funny about being in the holiness of God's presence and you felt like you didn't deserve what was going on that's the way that Isaiah felt uh, the woe is a confession 
It's a statement that is being made upward to God. It is a revival of looking on what's on high. It's a revival of height. As Isaiah looks up and sees the Lord, and when he did, his whole attitude changed. He began to acquiesce everything that he was for everything that was before him. Here is a man that is discovering himself. I want you to notice the atmosphere that God approached him in. He did not come at this point as he did in later times in a manger. But here we see the glory of God. The seraphims and the cherubims, uh, the holy, holy, holies, uh, the moving of the spirit, uh, the filling of the temple with smoke, uh, and in the midst of all what I consider to be very divine, very majestic, very much a state of efficacy, I see that there was something else uh, that was not discovered to this point, uh, and that is Isaiah discovered the acuteness of God, the awareness of God, uh, and how that humanness feels so incomplete in the presence of God. But yet it's a very moving situation. And it's a very beautiful situation. Uh, for what could be any beautiful uh, than, or more beautiful to man uh, than for man uh, to be visited by God uh, and in his incompletes uh, see one that loves him uh, and can give him everything. Isaiah looked upward and it changed his whole life. I'm concerned about people that are living today in a believing, unbelieving state. There are three persons that live in each one of us. It's the one that we think we are, the one that other people think we are, and the one that God knows that we are. And God knew Isaiah. God help me to constantly discover not what other people are thinking about me. It's not that I'm not concerned about that. But the most important thing is this moment is what does God know about me? What does God know about me? What is upward revival? Upward revival is seeing the Lord in all of his holiness. I'm going to quickly move through some of these scriptures. We won't have time to read them because of our time allotment. But in Matthew, the 16th chapter, there's a story that's told. Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he began to ask. He says, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some said, well, since you've asked Jesus, uh, we'll tell you. In fact, there's a variety of thinking as to who you are. Some say that uh, thou art Elias. Others say that they think you're Jeremiah's. Others even say that you're one of the prophets. Uh, others say that you're John the Baptist. But he looked at a man and he said, but whom do you? And he pointed at Simon. Who do you say that I am? And Simon said, I know who you are. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And because of that, Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood, has not revealed that unto thee, but my Father which is from heaven. And because of this, I'm going to give you this, the kingdom of heaven. And you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. But I want you to notice that the key to Peter getting a hold to the things of God and later becoming the spokesman of Pentecost was because this man looked 
upward uh, and he discovered uh, all that God was uh, and in the midst of the variety of thoughts uh, there was one that knew who he was I like to be around people that know who he is I like to be around people that are looking up uh, and Peter characterized the very God that we served. Oh, there's something about looking up uh, from the bottom. Huh? There's something about looking at our humanness and all that we are uh, and all that we are not uh, and acquiescing to him uh, and looking up. Uh, I'm talking about an upward revival. Uh, I'm talking about recognizing afresh the God we serve, uh, what he can do in our lives, uh, the way he can touch our lives, uh, the way he can move upon the scene uh, the glory that he brings with him when he comes uh, the way that he can play upon the cards of our soul uh, the way that he can touch our lives uh, and vibrate the very beings uh, the way that he can smell he can fill the room with the smoke of his glory and make us feel like we're nothing uh, so that we can see that he is everything Hallelujah. Paul said it in another way. He said, oh, that I might know him. <laughs> oh, that I might know him. He went on to say, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, whatever characterizes the attributes of our God, then think on these things. That's upward revival. That's looking from the bottom up. That's forgetting about what everybody else is and what everybody else is not and what they're doing and what they're not doing and filling our lives with the presence of God by coming into the midst of God and letting the great glory of God come over our lives and seeing us for what we really are. In Luke, the seventh chapter, a story is told of a man that came to Jesus he had come some distance looking for Jesus, and he finally found him. And he said unto the master, he said, Please come to my house, for my servant is very sick. Uh, and Jesus, uh, or he said, uh, he said uh, my servant's very sick, he said. Uh, and, he, and Jesus said, Well, where is he? He said, Well, he's at my house. And Jesus relinquished to the fact and said, Well, we'll go there, and I'll touch him, and I'll heal him. And, and the man said, Oh, Lord, that's not necessary. He said, All you've got to do is just speak the word. I want you to know that Jesus wasn't used to that. <laughs> Jesus wasn't even used to that kind of a faith. Uh, he said, just speak the word, Lord, and thy servant uh, shall be healed. Uh, for you see, I'm a man under authority, uh, and I tell people what to do. Uh, and when, they, when I tell them what to do, they do that. You're a man of authority. All you've got to do is speak the word, uh, and it will be done. Oh, that a, a spirit uh, and a characterization would come across the church like never before that all that would have to be done uh, is that the word could be spoken uh, and that would be enough for us to look up uh, and realize that God is in our midst. In Acts chapter 4, in the midst of persecution, Peter said as he looked upward toward heaven, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Uh, there's something about turning up to God with your problems. And that's where real revival starts. Uh, it's turning up to God. It's looking at God. It's acknowledging all that he is. Uh, it's acknowledging all that he is in all of his eternity. And, uh, and, and Peter said, and now, Lord, I like that. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Uh, and the Lord did. And there was revival that swept across that place. And the Bible says the Holy Ghost moved in again. The Spirit of the Lord fell upon them. For they had looked toward heaven. And acknowledged God as being the source of what could eliminate their problems. Upward revival will eliminate your problems. Upward revival will touch your life. I'm talking about looking on high and realizing afresh the glory of God. Simeon was an old man that looked for the consolation of Israel. 
He was a man that looked for the consolation of Israel. What are you living for, Simeon? I'm living to see the Messiah come. I'm living to see the birth of the Messiah child. How old are you? I'm 96 years old. How long have you been looking for this? Oh, I've been looking for this for years. <laughs> What's your greatest motive in life? To see the birth of the child. And the Bible says there was a day that came that the child was born. He was taken to be circumcised by Simeon and for him to offer his blessings upon him. And at that point, when he saw the Christ child, the Bible says that he was willing to acquiesce or give up and say, I'm ready to die now. I have seen the glory of God. I have seen the Messiah. I have seen all that is. I have come close to the very thing that has made me and has moved me. There's nothing greater in life for me now. I have seen the Christ child. There's nothing that could bless me anymore. I'm ready to depart from the scene. This man had his eyes on an upward revival. He was sensitive. He was aware. And he relinquished himself to the Spirit of God. Amen. Josk, you've had a lot of problems, but just keep looking up. You've fought a lot of opposition at home, but when you're in the surrounding of God's presence, it makes all the difference in the world. Amen. I've seen him come to school with his chin down, and maybe some of you don't know the situation that he lives in. I've seen him come to school with his chin down and depressed. But I've seen him in the midst of the glory of God. Uh, and let upward revival touch his life. Uh, hold on to it, son. Uh, hold on to it. It'll make all of the difference within your world. Uh, it'll make all of the difference. There was a time that Jesus thought it necessary to speak unto the Jews. And he looked at them and he said, listen. He said, you've spoken against the Son of Man a lot of times. But on that day and occasion, they had spoken against the works of the Son of Man. He said, you can speak against the Son of Man all that you want. But don't speak against the works. For the works are from my Father. The works are coming from on high. The works that you've seen done are the glory of God. They come from where everything is pure and everything is holy. Everything is divine and everything is majestic. Criticize me for the things that I'm doing. You can mock me in my flesh. But when I lay my hands on a withered hand and it's made straight by the power of God, for God's sake, don't criticize that. That's upward revival meeting man's needs. And it was at that time that Jesus thought it worthy to speak also on the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. I'm reminded at this point of the story that's, that's told that, that we often read in the Bible where, where Mary and Martha were at the house of Jesus and there had been a dinner and now the dishes needed to be cleaned and Martha was in the, the kitchen just to working away and cleaning the dishes and Mary had never made her entrance into the kitchen. And uh, Martha began to wonder where she was at, uh, how she had been distracted. Uh, and so she came back into the area of where she had left Mary. And she had found her there sitting at the feet of Jesus. Uh, and there was a spirit of wrath and anger that rose up within her. Uh, and she looked at the master. She was too mad to approach Mary. She looked at Jesus and she said, Master, she says, why doesn't Mary help me with the cleaning of the dishes? I, and I'll be honest with you, there was nothing wrong with that attitude of Martha there. I, I can understand the feeling that would come across her when she would thought that Mary was too lazy to do it. But she, uh, she was just misunderstanding something. Huh? I would think you were lazy too if you could help uh, when you could and yet you didn't. But see, there was something that was going on there that Martha did. 
did not understand. Uh, and Jesus, for this time, had to make an exception. Uh, and he took up for Mary. Uh, and he said, oh, Martha, 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 Mary uh, is seeking about the things of the kingdom of God. Uh, there's one thing, uh, friend, uh, that it's not wrong to be distracted by. And that's when we can come uh, in his presence uh, and learn uh, of the things uh, of the kingdom of God. Uh, there's a lot of things that can buy our time. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can waste in the foolishness of moments that pass by. But never friend will you regret the moments uh, that you sit at his feet uh, and you look up to him uh, and you learn about the things of the kingdom of God that's an upward revival and that's the position that Isaiah was in in John chapter 6 uh, verses 30 through 32 the Bible tells us a story there they were asking Jesus some particular questions. That is, the Pharisees were asking him. And they said, listen, you've been here for a while. What sign show us us thou then uh, that we may believe thee? Uh, do something for us, Lord, that we may see that you're the Lord. After all, our father Moses uh, gave us manna to eat in the desert. Uh, as it is written, he gave them bread to eat. Uh, and then Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Moses did not give you that bread from heaven. Moses gave you a very temporal bread. But there's not but one that can feed your soul. There's not but one that can sustain the eternal part of your life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses did not give you that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. What was Jesus doing there? He was taking up for what was right. He was saying Moses never sought to or gave you the glory of God. But only my father reveals the glory of God. Moses gave you a temporal bread. But if you want the things of God then you've got to look to the source of where they really come from. You've got to look for him. In Mark chapter 12 Verses 28 through 34. It says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. That is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This there is one other commandment, or there is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribes said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. For there is none other. Uh, there is one God, and there is none other but He, and to love Him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love His neighbor as Himself, is more than all the burnt offerings, and all the sacrifices that I have ever done. And when Jesus heard Him, and saw that He answered discreetly, or pointedly, He looked into that man, and said, Oh, I don't know who you are, but I can tell you one thing. You have repeated and agreed to what I have said, and I'm going to say one thing to you uh, if you really believe what you said you're not far from the kingdom of God you can't be far from the kingdom of God and after that no other man did ask him a question for here is a man that repeated what Jesus said a man that was looking upward oh there's a revival on the eve of God's rapture and I'm not talking about some revival that will sweep the land in great numbers and maybe that's so but I'm talking about an individual revival. A revival when we start looking at ourselves instead of themselves. A revival that becomes me instead of all of the rest of everybody. A revival that makes me cry woe. A revival that makes me cry undone. A revival that puts me in the glory of 
his presence. A revival that makes me see the whole earth filled with his glory. A revival that makes me see the Lord of hosts is near me. I'm talking about a revival of looking up to him and realizing that he is all I need. For I am complete in him. In 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, and I'm not going to read it. I'll just give a, a brief touch of what's going on. In the 18th chapter, actually, the reign of Hezekiah began. He was the 13th king of Judah. He was the seventh good king of Judah. There was a revival under Hezekiah because he rebelled against Assyria. Then there was a captivity of the ten tribes by Assyria during the reign of Hezekiah. And then there was an invasion of Judah who Hezekiah ruled over. And Hezekiah had to submit and he paid a tribute to the king of Assyria which was, I believe, Sennacherib. But that wasn't enough tribute. Judah was insulted by Assyria. And Assyria turned around and also not insulted only Judah, but the God of Judah. Sennacherib got so bold that in the, the 19th chapter, we see that he even defies God. And that got to be too much. 
and Hezekiah in the 14th verse of the 19th chapter of 2 Kings decided that it was time to take the problem to God. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. That was a letter or an ultimatum from Sennacherib. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord. And I like this. And he spread it before the Lord. <laughs> he just laid it out before the Lord. That's what an upward revival will do. It'll, it'll call you to take your problems to God before you take them anywhere else. <laughs> Hezekiah took it and he laid it out before the Lord. He spread it out. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O oh Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, the God alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of my proponent uh, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and the lands. Uh, and unless you move, God, uh, they're going to do me like they've done the rest. Uh, but the key was uh, that he laid it before God uh, and he looked up uh, and a revival happened. Uh, there was some Something that began to shake the place. Uh, and Assyria laid not her hand upon it. Uh, for Hezekiah looked toward God. In Luke chapter 11 verses 30 through 32. Verse 30. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But I'm telling you, he says, there's a greater, one that's Sol there's a greater than Solomon that's here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. But behold, he said, there's a greater one than Jonah is here. He said, listen to me, Jews. I stand in your presence. Oh, I stand in your presence as the Messiah. But I'm telling you that the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south, will rise up in judgment against you. For she heard of the glory of Solomon's kingdom. And she believed it. The men of Nineveh, he said, will rise up in judgment against this generation. They repented at the preaching of a preacher. But I'm telling you, there's a greater one than just a preacher here. But you're dealing with the Lord God Almighty. Oh, what was he condemning them for? He was condemning them because they would not give God the glory. They would not look up. He said men paid and changed their attitudes because of Solomon and because of Jonas. And yet a greater than Jonas is here. Something more wonderful and full of wisdom than Solomon. But you won't listen to him. You won't turn upward. You won't look from the bottom up. Uh, and God cannot deal with you because of that. John the Baptist. He had, he had no problem denouncing himself, relinquishing himself to everything that, that Jesus was. Now, the way I read it, I guess there, there is a little point there where he was shaken in his faith. He was in prison. If you can imagine that scene within your mind, he, he, his ministry had just come to a, a screeching halt. And he was in prison. And some of, the, some of his friends and the apostles were visiting him. And down in his spirit. And they said unto him, Well, John, we've got to go. Is there anything that you want us to tell anybody? You want us to tell Jesus? He said, Yes. He said, I've got a question. I'd like you to ask him. They said, well, what is it, John? He said, would you ask him, is it he, or should we look for another? You know, a little question mark coming over John. Is he, is it he, or should we look for another? And I want you to notice how Jesus answered his question. 
They went and told Jesus that. They said, we visited John. Oh, how's he doing? He's down in his spirits, Master. And he asked us to ask you, is it he or should he look for another? I would imagine there was a smile that came across Jesus' face. And Jesus said, well, you just go tell John, yes. No, that's not what he said. He said, you go tell John that the blind receive their sight. You go tell John that the deaf ears are being unstopped. You go tell John that the lame are walking and the blind are seeing. That's all that you've got to do. Go tell John those things. And when John heard those things, uh, John's mind was satisfied. There was no problem. When he heard that, his heart turned again. Uh, nobody had to tell him, yes, uh, he just said, tell him that the blind and the, and the dumb and the lame are getting their healings. Uh, and that was enough for John to know it's him. Uh, for only those things can come from on high. Only those things. I'm challenging you today to the best of my ability to preach. Oh, that we could today in 1981 become more eternity conscious than everything or any time that we ever have before. Oh, I would like to walk from this chapel and let every day from this moment be under the eye and the scrutiny of God like never before. Every amount of tithe that I pay, everything that I do be done in the light of the judgment seat. Every sermon that I prepare, God, let me prepare it uh, looking from the bottom up. Uh, being in the middle of your glory, God. Oh, looking from the power on high. That is the supreme need of our life today. God, give us an upward vision. What have we got if we've got an all-time high in attendance, but we're at the bottom spiritually? What have we got if we've got everything else and we don't have him? Well, one writer characterized it. He said, what have you got if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Oh, I'm talking about looking at him afresh. And I get, I get tickled. I don't mind saying the way that the sixth chapter began. Because it began with the glory of God coming in and it did take Isaiah no time. When he saw those seraphims flying around and the wings and the smoke filling the place and all the glory and the holies. I mean, boy, you're talking about an entrance. You, you think inauguration. <laughs> oh, this was proclamation, friend. <laughs> I mean, there was an escort. <laughs> and when Isaiah saw the kingdom of God in all of her organization, <laughs> when Isaiah saw the kingdom of God in all her majesty and glory and her display, he said, I'm undone. My God, woe is me. But then there's an inward revival. And that's willing to look at yourself. And that's what happened in the story as it continues. In verse 5, or verse 6, it says, Then one of the seraphims flew unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, the word woe means grief. The word lo is a word that means behold. It means to hearken. It means to, to call attention to the expressed wonders or surprises of God. Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thy iniquity is taken away and thy sins is purged. And Isaiah got that touch. I want you to notice from the coals that had come off of the altar. To me it's significant that what burned his life and what changed his life and what purged him and got him to where he needed to be was an experience that came red hot from off the altar. An inward revival, willing to look at yourself. It's a low revival. It's a beholding revival. It's a giving attention revival. It's a cleansing revival. 
The woe revival is an upward revival, a revival of height. It's a revival of confession. The low revival is a revival of cleaning. It's a revival of inwardness. It's a revival of depth. It's an altar revival. It's a revival of discovering what you've got after you come away from the altar. And that's exactly what God did with a bashful Simon. He turned a bashful Simon into a bold Simon Peter. And not knowing fully what he possessed, he said, I'm sorry, I don't have any silver, and I don't have any gold. And all of a sudden, something hit him. Oh, but such as I have, give I unto thee. A revival of the inward parts will make you discover what God has placed on the inside of you. Peter discovered who he was when the inward revival began to take place in his life. You know, there was the time when he said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, well, I'm sorry. If I don't wash your feet, then you don't have any part with me in the kingdom. And Peter said, oh, God, now, if you're going you're gonna to play those kind of games, then, then, Lord, don't want to wash my feet, but wash me all over. Just give me a bath, Jesus. Just bathe me down, for I don't want to miss the kingdom of God. An inward revival will say, Lord, not just my feet, <laughs> but all over. An inward revival will make you discover the sin or the deficiencies within your life. An inward revival will make you look in and realize that every day of your life you need to be touched from the coals that come off of the red hot fires of God. And 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and I'm not going to do nothing but just survey the chapter, but it's a beautiful chapter. The 34th chapter begins with the reign of Josiah. It shows that he began at the age of eight, kept it 30 years. There was a religious revival that broke out under Josiah. He took it, and land, the land was in apostasy, but he turned her around. He repaired the altar. That's one of the first things that he done. He, and then in the repairing of the altar, he discovered the law. And he began to read the law. And when he did, it showed up the insufficiencies within his life. Uh, and he began to qu inquire in verse 21 of the Lord concerning uh, that. Uh, and his heart was of such a nature of looking inward uh, that prophecy came by the prophetess Huldah. And the Bible says uh, that prophecy came and said, as far as your land, Josiah, is concerned, I'm telling you that your people have forsaken me. They have burned incense to other gods. They have provoked me to anger. My wrath shall be poured upon them. But I'm going to tell you, Josiah, because that heart was tender and thou humblest thyself before God, uh, when thou heard his words uh, and you preached and you told the people, uh, I will gather thee to thy fathers uh, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Uh, there is going to be a failure that's going to come across your people but not upon you Josiah for the inward look and the attitude that you had the New Testament says it like this if we will examine ourselves now then we will need no examining in the future if we will judge ourselves now it be not that we need to be judged in the future looking inward looking at yourself discovering the inward revival An inward revival will make you the last one leave the altar. An inward revival will make you the first one in the prayer meeting. An inward revival will make you not only study, but it will teach you who the God of your studies are. Hallelujah. An inward revival will not only teach you between knowing the Word of God, but knowing the God of the Word. An inward revival. Oh, I said it not too long ago, I said it again. Oh, friend, it's not the Antichrist. It's not the, it's not the occult that I fear today. But if there's anybody that I would fear in a religious sense, it would be unbelieving believers. Oh, I fear unbelieving believers. If I was to miss the rapture of the church, I do believe that the thing that I would fear the most is the wrath of, the, of those that call themselves the people of God that did not make it. Oh, God, Brother Bushnell, if there's anything that I wouldn't want to do is miss the rapture of the church. 
and be caught in this chapel when the swarm uh, of the unbelieving believers uh, came into this place uh, looking for God. I'd, I'll be honest with you, and I've said it before. I would rather sinner occupies my pews than unbelieving believers. God give us inward revival. The scientific world has broken the sound barrier. The lustful world has broken the sin barrier. Oh, that we could, we could get a point where we break the doubt barrier. I was at Ellington Air Force Base the other day watching the jets, and I'll be finished in just a moment. I won't keep you. Touch and go as they, they left the, the runway there. And you could hear them as they would get off into the distance. They would flip those afterburners on, and the power and the thrust would make you want to salute and be proud of your flag. But they tell me those jets can go so fast that they can break the sound barrier. I've heard them as they come over, and you'd hear that sonic boom as it would break the sound barrier. Oh, friend, the world has broken the sound barrier. People have broken the sin barrier. Pornography and lust and immorality parades our streets. Un, unbashful, unshameful in the open. God, that the church and we today in this chapel could break the doubt barrier and have an inward sonic boom go on in our hearts that would melt us at the altars of God where we would cry inside, Woe is me. God, burn my lips up. Uh, Touch me with your presence, God. Melt me in your spirit, God. Let me acquiesce to everything that I'm not uh, so I can be everything that you are. Oh, God. And then there's the onward revival. In verse 9, something happened. And he said, go and tell this people. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then he said, here am I. I mean from a bashful fella to somebody that was ready to charge. An upward revival, an inward revival, and an onward revival. The clock is creeping up to midnight. As I am preaching this very moment and closing my message, the clock of this world is ticking down. The clock of this world is ticking away. As we peek through the windows of our apartments at night, we see a sky that covers Houston that becomes black with its velvet and its blackness. It's that same sky of spirituality that's coming upon this world. Oh, if you transfer this into the politics, friend, we see politics without a guiding star today. If we were to transfer this into religion, we see a religion without morals today. We see gross darkness in religion. We see gross darkness in the morals of this world. Oh, but there's something that can happen to our life. There's something that can change. I'm talking about an onward revival. An onward revival. The birth of the natural child is a predated thing. By months of burden and by days of travail, so is the birth of a spiritual child. It don't happen overnight. Jesus prayed for his church, but he was willing to see her make such a spiritual birth that he gave himself in death for that church. He just didn't pray for the church, but he gave himself in death to that church. I'm talking about something that we can give our lives for. I'm talking about something that will move us upwardly. I'm talking about something that will move us inwardly. I'm talking about something that will move us on the outside. Something that will get a hold of our hearts. The greatest thing that plagued the life of Jacob and of his marrying Leah and Rachel was the fact that the one that he really loved, that is Rachel, could not bear any children. Jacob dumped all kind of fortunes and jewels on her, but there was a barrenness within her womb. There was a sterility within her life. And she finally got to the point uh, that she fell beneath the altars uh, and she cried before the prophet of God. Uh, nothing could hake it. Uh, she was just flat eat up with jealousy when Leo's little kids would run around and pull on her skirts. Uh, and she wanted a child so bad she finally said give me children or lest I die. 
an onward revival, a revival that makes you cry. Hear my Lord, send me. A revival that will move us beyond the extremes. A revival that will make us squeeze between the porch and the altar and say, God, move me and send me. I'm talking about a revival on the eve of God's rapture. It's coming, friend. But a revival on the eve of his rapture. Revive me upward. I want to know my God. Revive me inward. I want to see myself as never before. Revive me onward. I want to see the sickening of the world.